Thank you so much for coming and having me here. Um, I know a lot of you, and I adore the folks who have put on this conference, so I was very happy to come talk about user experience, developers, and the tools that developers use. So I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about what is user experience, and why do we need to think about the UX of developer tools? I'm going to present a case study, a recent project I worked on improving developer tools. And then we're going to do an interactive part. And I hope this will be the most meaningful and um, fun part of the session. I'll try to get my talking out of the way first. Uh, to uh, try to think about workflow and work domains and how do we make de developer tools better. So. These first two things I'm going to talk about concurrently is what is user experience? What, what is a user experience? What is this user experience you speak of? Um, I come from an academic background in human-computer interaction. And before that, I was a librarian. And so I've been thinking about how humans organize information, how they use computers to build data, how they use how the human aspects of computing work for quite some time. And I'm not the only one. Uh, I will be, this will be a little bit of a history lesson. This is the newest framework that I am presenting in this talk, and it's from the year 2000. This is Jesse James Garrett's Elements of User Experience. And I really, this is a classic of, this is a classic for a reason. And it's a very elegant presentation of how visual design, the things that you see when you use an app, when you use a tool, when you use any computational interface, it's at the very top. But as you go down, there's we start at the bottom with user needs, site objectives, specifications and requirements. And then as we get up into the more iterative parts of, of, of tools. We think about interactions, how information is organized, how the inter what are the elements of the interface. And uh, you know, a lot of, there is, and I'm in a room full of Python developers, so I want to be careful with my words. Um, there's a sort of back-end chauvinism in a lot of developer communities that, oh, well, we're going to build the back-end, and then somebody else can worry about the front-end. But the thing that I think is very salient about Jesse's, Jesse's elements is that there's no back-end and front-end to this. The entire, the entire stack is here. And user experience permeates all aspects of technology, not just the front, the very front end that you can see and touch and push the buttons on. Um, and there's certainly, there's certainly quite a lot of examples we can probably think of from our own lives, from our own work projects, of the, way, the very guts of systems impacting how you can use them. So to give you that brief example of what the domain of user experience is, I'm going to present another framework, and this one is from 1995. Um, about, so now that we know what a user experience is, how do we gauge what a good one is? Like what are the elements of like, okay, this works? And the first is the visibility of system status. Like, is this thing on? Am I, can I go forward, can I go backwards? And I think we've all used tools, developer-centric tools and not, where we don't know where we are, we don't know if we are, have made a mistake. The second is the match between the system and the real world. So I think this is something that developers encounter a lot in terms of integration. Um, okay, so we're working with this framework, but this other tool we use like doesn't completely integrate, and we have to we have to bridge gaps in between systems. Um, and this is a huge part of what I do is thinking, okay, what is the world that already exists 
either in the context of how people are working, what they're trying to accomplish, and how can whatever we're trying to build match that. And this, is, this reflects not only tasks, but also language and visual elements. User control and freedom. And so this is the emergency exit clause. Um, if you want to leave, leave. If you, if you want to save and quit and get your data out, where, where is, how does that exist? And this is, I think, one of the most pressing issues in terms of design of applications at any level um, these days. And you know, undo and redo. Consistency and standards, uh, a group of uh, Python developers, I think, will be in line with this. Like, let's have consistency and standards. Um, error prevention. How, let's make it easier to not mess up. And I think this is one thing that Python is wonderful at. Um, the, the conventions of the Python language and some of the tools for Python are really helpful in terms, in terms of assisting building functional co code. Recognition rather than recall. This is a huge one. Um, let's just recognize what we need to do instead of having to initiate the process from the very beginning. Um, and this is, this is, um, this is this is the question of do we have you know, of menus like let's rec let's give you the choices instead of having you having to give you your order right from the beginning. Flexibility and efficiency of use, and in terms of Python tools, and I'll go into this later. I think that there is uh, that uh, the Python community and uh, Python developer tools give a lot of flexibility and efficiency of use. There. Are, beginner focused tools there are um, there are, there are more more configurable tools and this allows folks to really tailor their actions and their workflow aesthetic and minimalist design um, and I think this is something that that backend developers get make clean code make a clean interface um, and this is something that goes through this this is, this is an attribute that's often thought of as a very front-end attribute, but I think we can all say that like, when you have, you, you, it's very easy to have a clean front-end and a messy back-end. Help users recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. Plain language, not codes. This is a huge command, command line issue. Like, how do you improve the you know, understanding what comes back? Um, how do you improve that interaction? How do you make that more seam less seamless? Like, and if we, if this we had solved this problem, um, we would not have Stack Overflow. Help and documentation. I think I, Heidi Waterhouse is in the audience, so <laughs> she's the she's the expert in this regard. But help and documentation are huge aspects of the user experience. Sure. Um, if we were all perfect people and we had perfect technologies, there would be no need for documentation, but documentation serves a different need in terms of interaction, in terms of documenting what we've done. And as I'll look in the case, to, I'll talk more about when I get into this case study I present, having proper documentation is essential for assimilating and having other people use your applications that are not you. So to move forward, what's the user experience of Python tools? And I know I said that I would not be doing Q&A, but I feel like this is, a, this is a time that I would love to hear folks talk more about what, the user experience, what their user experiences have been with Python tools. Um, I am not a professional pro programmer. I work in user experience. But I have played with Python a lot, and I've really enjoyed it. And uh, one of the most delightful experiences I've had is using IPy notebooks. Um, these are, these present a very, you know, adaptable user experience that allow for the beginner to get going and to, to become less, become, to, to quickly advance past the beginner phase. I also 
do not need to say this probably, but the Python documentation stack is so amazing. Um, and uh, this is a huge part of building a user experience for a programming language. So any questions, any, any thoughts from the peanut gallery um, moving forward? All right, so my goal is to get through this as quickly as possible so we can then chew on things and work some things out. So I'm, I, I'm presenting a case study, and this is a recent project that I worked on that's still in progress, but how do you, develop, how do you improve the developer experience? Um, user experience designers and researchers, people who work with product, love to talk about their process, and um, I, am not, I am not anomalous in that regard, but uh, the paradigm that I use to describe my process is the Stanford D School paradigm, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And this, I, I think this is a very elegant graphic, but it does present a more linear perception, and oftentimes it's emphasize, define. It go, there's a lot of back and forth. And after you test and find new problems, defining and empathizing with them as well, so this, I've seen this represented as a circle, but I didn't like the way it looked. So, <laughs> and I, I need to fire up Sketch, I guess, and um, create some better graphics. But, you know, I, my, my process really emphasizes starting from empathy. Um, those of you who know me, I really like to use this, uh, this quote that you can empathize with someone when you can start to tell their story. Because we're, as human beings, our narrative capacities are not completely, um, not completely consistent. Uh, we can all see five things. Uh, we can all see the same, we can, five people can see the same thing and describe it completely differently. But when you can say, okay, well, this is, this is what I see Joe, the problem that Joe is having, that will allow us to, um, to start, to, start gen to start speaking from a perspective other than our own, and then defining problems. So earlier this, earlier this year, I went out to uh, this building that was in Beaverton. I think it belonged to the uh, sneaker company. I don't know. Um, and <laughs> I'm, gonna keep this I'm gonna keep this vague because I don't, you know, some of this stuff is, uh, you know, I, my waiver always says for sharing for research purposes. So as we move into this part of the presentation, uh, especially the video, no, no reproduction. If you see someone you know in there, you know, pretend you don't know them, uh, and uh, and no, no, no repro reproducing it. But they had built this tool, and it was to uh, for their internal QA across the enterprise, and it was this sort of dinky dashboard. And there was no documentation, and it wasn't really clear how you're supposed to use it. And they said, "We don't, we don't know why no one's using this." <laughs> so the first thing I did was sat down with this application, and I was like, "Okay, what are the things you can do from it?" And sort of trace the user flow, like. If I'm sitting, if I'm coming to this, like, what are the things I can do? And this is not super linear. Like, I can go there, I can go there. Where does that go? I don't know. Um, so I got my, I, I, ha I mapped out my own experience with it. But because I am not the user, and this is, if there's one thing that I can impart to you all, is that you are not your users. Um, it's, a lot of developers, a lot of developer tools are developed to scratch one person's itch to fill one person's need. And if they're useful, if they're, they scratch the right itch, other folks will use them. But as we, as, as other folks use them, they have different needs. And we like to, if you wanna talk about scale, you can't really scale this. I'm building something for my own needs and other people can use it or GTFO. Uh, that's just not the right approach, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and especially if you want to build tools that other people can use. So we did some user sessions. Uh, and this was a hybrid of usability testing and user interviews. So instead of 
bringing in some folks to sit in a conference room and giving them a set, set of tasks and saying, can you accomplish this? Which is how traditional usability testing works. We, we, set, we set aside two hours with five users. And this is, this is a well-known user experience cliche. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this theory that you can uncover 80% of usability problems if you do if you do five user interviews or five usability tests. Um, I've used it as a rule of thumb and I think it works and there's some there's some data to back this up. But you know, to it, it, this is I, I have some doubts about you know that that ratio. But anyway, um, I would say if you're going to in, embark on any usability or user or research, have a have a group of at least five. That's that's my hard line. Anyway, so we did a tech tour. We met folks at their desks. We went, walked around their offices. We said, who do you work with? How do you work? What is your workflow? Um, then we delved into using the application. And I'll show you the video of that, which is kind of hilarious because there were lots of usability problems. And then we talked a little bit more about their mental models. So like. This doesn't really fit together in the current application, but how does it fit together in your work? How does it fit together in your process? And then, like we will do very soon, I like to use markers and paper to get folks out of their, out of, away, from the, away from their screens and to think about things in different perspectives. And we did some journey mapping, having folks map up out their own universes. And rather than just barging into someone's office and getting up in their business, uh, the process for setting up a project like this is that I, like, we get the stakeholders together and we say, okay, what do we want to know? And we put together something that's like a script. Um, this, is, this is the little script for, my, for the usability probe. And uh, this comes from Steve Krug's um, usability, it, rapid iterative usability testing. And it's just uh, asking folks to open the applications, do what they would normally do, and think out loud. And from this point, you can ask them follow-up questions, but I think the most valuable aspect in this is just seeing, seeing the application through another person's perspective. And saying, yes, please tell me more. Oh, why do you think that? All right, so this next part is Walter, Walter Benjamin saying, please no mechanical reproduction. When we do user interviews, we, I often videotape them because it's nice to be able to share that. But, um, it, but it's for research purposes. So no one, you know, we want to respect privacy. All right, so thank you for sitting through that, that video. Um, You'll never guess what happened next. <laughs> um, using uh, using the using that tape and some other tapes, um, we brought we brought you know we brought our findings to the the product owners, and we identified areas that needed improvement that would make a huge difference. And the number one was uh, was documentation. There was no documentation for this tool. Um, that was in circulation. There was, no, there was no easy way to integrate this into their process. Um, so we, so we, we, we made a proposal for content strategy. And the next, and also made some proposals for better accommodating workflow. And in this next part of uh, the session, we'll delve into workflow a little bit more um, and sort of turn the, turn the microscope on ourselves. Um, so defining the problems and the next two step the, the next step is a lo-fi prototyping session to improve this tool to build a dashboard that actually accommodates workflows and then we'll test it again. Um, huh. So now it's time to try this all out. Um, before the session, I asked for a couple of volunteers who did not mind being 
asked about their workflow. So if the folks who I did solicit um, could go stand by the white stickies on the wall, uh, that would be great. Um, and then I need a couple more folks who would be willing to have their peers interrogate them about how they work and what sorts of things they do, do with the various tools that they use. Who here works as a developer and has a complicated stack of tools? <laughs> you, sir, <laughs> go stand by a, by a sticky. There's one in the back. You go stand by that one. Oh yeah, there's a bag, and there's a bag of markers and, and sticky notes that this young lady will be handing out. I need one more volunteer. Yes, Lois, good to see you. There's a sticky right here. Yes. All right, now we're gonna, I don't know, maybe, um, yeah, so we're gonna divide into groups now. Everybody's gotta get out of their chairs. I'm sorry, it's Saturday. I know that you are, um, you're cozy, but um, find, find someone you, you are interested in interrogating and go stand by them. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, just as many, just to, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so just to go to the go to the sticky nearest you or the person that you do not know. And then the next uh, the next uh, the next part will be to get a marker and draw six six circles draw an onion so there's there's a volunteer who is the interviewee and then there is a volunteer who will be the drawer of circles and the scribe um, so pick pick those in your groups. Yeah. Yes. It's it's fine. Yeah, I just you know I think consent is a good thing. Yes. Is everyone drawing their circles? <laughs> and if you just came into the room, uh, feel free to drop into one of these small groups. All right, so now we're going to label these circles. And in the, the very middle circle is the user. This is the, the person you're interviewing. Um, so label that however you'd like. Uh, the, the, and the next, the next circle, this is, this, is another, this is another framework that's very old. This was, this was designed to analyze how nuclear reactor operators um, did, their, did their work. Um, and I guess the, it's called the onion, but sometimes I call it Homer Simpson's donut, because I think like, this is Homer Simpson at his control station. So the next, the next level is the task at hand. So like lay, level, layer that for the ta task at hand. And so this is pushing your code to Git, running a test, you know, individual tasks. The next, uh, the next circle is, is the workflow. So how do all the tasks fit together? The next layer of this is the this is the work domain. Uh, this is the 
This is the work domain. So this is maybe not just you, but you and everybody else on your team. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the next layer up. The next, the next level of the, the next layer of the onion is your workplace. So the organization you work in and how that, how that impacts how you do your work because everyone who's had more than one job can start a story with, well, we don't do, we don't do it here the way that we did it there. Um, and then the top level is the, the higher domain. So this is the industry you work in, this is the city you live in, the country you live in, how, what you bring to this and the things you have in common, the things you have not in common with the folks that you work with in the industry that you work in. This is the top level work domain. So everyone, everyone following, any questions there? Um, go ahead, take some time and label, label your circles. Uh, if you haven't already. All right, so I'm gonna put some time, we're gonna take 10 minutes. We're gonna spend the first, how much time do we have? Keep, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna spend the first five coming up with questions that address all of these layers. And then we'll spend the next one populating these pieces of paper, and you can, there are sticky notes as well, so you can add some metadata on top of what are all these factors. So you can organize this however you'd like. You can spend, you can break out, come up with questions, or you can just start asking them going from the outside to the inside of the, the onion. Yeah, so uh, what are you doing right now? What are the applications you have? Uh, what tools do you use to do your job? Like, what are your favorite tools that you use to use to use your job? Do your job. Um, what tools do you use in your current job that you didn't use in your last job? What tools did you use at your last job that you liked but you don't use in your current job? So those sorts of things and. We, we don't have a ton of time, so attack this however you'd like. Um, you know. The goal of the question is, is to better understand uh, what, we're, what tools are for and how, for the, how they, they can work better. Huh. All right, so fire away. <laughs> I'm gonna turn off this microphone, just come get at me. I'm gonna go around. Hello, our time is up, uh, but we can stay in this room until they kick us out. I don't know, Rachel, Rachel can tell us <laughs> when we're kicked out.